Well, I've known John Cock almost since I came to IBM, I think. I came to IBM in 59, and I, I know I've known him since 1960 because we were on a task force together then. And that's my first clear recollection of, of John. Okay. I've known John Cock since uh, probably 1960. I came to IBM in 1959, and uh, I certainly met John at the first task force I was on. He was, we were both members of a task force that was held in 1960, so I've known him at least since then. I've known John Cox since 1959 or 60, probably. I came to IBM in 59, and I know I met John on a task force in 1960. It was a task force that was about uh, IBM's, well, IBM Research's cryogenic project, which uh, in those days was quite a big deal, but it was not clear that it was going to be a, a success, and there was a task force to evaluate what had been done up to that time, and I met John there. And I remember meeting this guy, this eccentric but brilliant guy who had, uh, in those days John was in his, in his uh, nicotine-stained scruffy phase, and he came in with his, with his grubby shirt and nicotine all over his fingers and a worn-out suit, and he, he sat there saying nothing for a while, and then the most you know, penetrating questions would come out. And I realized that with, with, here was somebody very unusual. He's not just, not just eccentric, but, but brilliant at, behind it. So, uh, and I've kept in, I've never worked with John, but I've kept in, in touch with him over the years. And, and uh, I guess I know him reasonably well, but no, I've never actually, apart from being on task forces, I've never collaborated with him. Well, there were other task forces that we were on. One that I remember is, was in the early 70s. It was the time of the so-called oil shortage. It turned out not to be a shortage. There certainly was, a, was an oil crisis, but it wasn't a shortage. But there was an, a, a, a lab-wide task force which was to look at what IBM could do in the light of what was supposed to be an oil shortage, whether IBM could do something for itself or something for society at large. And there was a sub-task force, which I think I actually chaired, but anyway, it consisted of me and John Cock and Dick Garwin, and what we looked at was the possible application of computer control to a car. And we had a lot of fun because uh, I guess all of us were interested in, this, in the mechanical part of it. We had a lot of fun and we came to the conclusion that, yes, you probably could do something by using computer control of the engine, but whether it was worth the money was another question. And then, of course, after that, it turned out that there wasn't really an oil shortage. It was just a manipulated crisis, and the, the economic incentive kind of went away. But that was another task force that I remember. Yes, I think so. I think he had. I think that the first task force, the 1960 task force, was at the time of stretch, and I think John had worked on that. I think he came in as one of the. If not one, I don't really know whether he was one of the architects of Stretch, but certainly one of the leading people in, in, uh, in its development. Yeah, he came in with a... We'd heard of him by the time he got there, let's put it that way. Well, I think we'd heard about John before he, got on the t before he appeared at the task force. I th this was at the time when Stretch had either just been developed or was being developed, and I think John was one of the leading people on that project, and he certainly came in with a reputation as, as a... Uh, with, with, a rep, with a reputation for having contributed you know, very significantly to the development of Stretch. So we'd heard about him before he got there. What was he known for? I think it's a computer, what you would now call a computer architect. I'm not sure that the word architecture was really bandied about in 1960, but, but that's, my impre that's my impression of what his contribution was anyway. Well, I always found working with John Cock to be very stimulating. You never know what to expect, but... Uh, you, in detail, but you know you're going to hear something fascinating every time you start. You have a conversation with John. It's maybe, it may be uh, something really new and important, and it may be some off-the-wall idea, which when you get to the end of it is in intriguing, but really leads nowhere. But you're never going to be bored when you're talking to John. That's for sure. One of the things I remember best about John, I think, is park conversations in the parking lot, and this was good many years ago, and in those days I had an arrangement with my family whereby if I was going to be home after six, I would promise to give a phone call. And many times I would get, in, I would get myself into trouble because I would be just going out to the, to the parking lot to get in my car, and here would come John Cock running over, hey, Ian, just let me say the following. And now you know that this, this introduction, which John, it seems to be so characteristic of John, you're going to be in for an hour or an hour and a half's conversation, which 
as I said, may lead nowhere, but it may be absolutely priceless. And so it, there's no way you can, uh, no way you can avoid listening to it. You must follow it through to the end. Ninety-five percent of the time, it leads nowhere, and five percent of the time, it's 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 priceless. I haven't had many phone conversations with John. I've had a few, but that's not my interaction with him. Has almost always been in person, as I, as I mentioned, either in these parking lot conversations. Or, or over lunch, and lunch uh, with John is not something that you can get through in five minutes either, because there's always important things to be discussed. I think I just ran into John occasionally in the cafeteria. We, both of us would be looking for a place to sit, and uh, we'd happen to bump into each other. I would characterize it, John as brilliant but eccentric, and uh, I think uh, he's he seems to be very well known in research and I'm sure in the outside world as well and I think everybody values him for the whole of him, not only for the eccentricity and all the marvelous stories that go with that, but for his real insights and the things he's really done over the years. No, there was, a, there was an idea, it was not invented in IBM, there was a gadget called the Cryotron which was thought to be an important new way of a new, important new logical device for computers, and IBM Research had a project to investigate this. And there were some aspects of the Emperor's new clothes which were suspect, and this task force was supposed to look at that. And in fact, we did find that the, really the Emperor had no clothes, and in the end, the, the project was uh, cancelled. But this was not the Josephson project, which is a... <laughs> I'm sorry to say, just a rerun of the same scenario. It looked fascinating at the beginning, but the Emperor's clothes didn't bear close inspection. But uh, John, was, John was, on, was on that task force, and we had a... We had meetings every day, I think, for several months. It was... Uh, well, most days for several months. It was... Uh, and I, I certainly learned a lot, of both about IBM and... and and about John in the, in the process. Well, I think what I learned about John was that he, he knows a lot about many different things, and he can, ask, he can ask questions which point to something really important in all sorts of subjects, so, so that uh, you can have, a, you can have a, a stimulating conversation with John on almost any technical subject you can think of. And he knows something, he knows something not necessarily very much, but he's, he, he thinks about it enough to put his finger on the interesting questions. Answer. I never wrote any papers with John or on, jo on any of John's ideas, but I certainly, he certainly threw out ideas like a firework. You know, there are ideas going in all possible directions when John is talking, and, and I'm sure that a lot of them landed on fertile soil. Well, I know a lot of them landed on fertile soil, but uh, I didn't actually work on any of them. No, because his field is really different from mine. It's hard for me to say what John's m most important contribution would be. I'm really not qualified because I'm not in that field, but the, the one that I know about that seems to me the most important is RISC, the Reduced Instruction Set Computing, which was, as I understand, John's own idea and which led to a good deal of work in research and has now been taken up by ev basically every manufacturer in the field, even by IBM. It's so long ago. I, I mean, I can remember what we concluded, and I can remember that John was John, and the, but that's, I can't remember much of the details. Mm, uh, somewhere, somewhere there's a report, but, uh, but who knows where. Do you have any memories of any... Uh, yeah, I can remember sitting down in the cafeteria. We, I think we had our meetings over lunch in the cafeteria, mostly, and I can remember sitting in the cafeteria with... with well, Dick Garwin wasn't always there because he was off and off in Washington running the country, but... Uh, I remember having meetings with uh, lunch with John, and we would discuss things. Yeah, I always found working with John very stimulating. Uh, yeah, there was a good deal of exchange of ideas, and I think uh, probably when you put the t you know two sources of ideas together, the, the result was probably more than the, the the sum was greater than the individual parts. But I, as I think I mentioned before, I never. I never uh, actually worked on any of John's ideas. My, my interaction with John has been inter technologically entertaining discussion rather than actual collaboration. I think what makes John a good researcher, uh, if that's the right word, is, is he's so original. He has all these far-out ideas, and he, some of them are lead nowhere, but there are 
there are enough nuggets of gold in there that to fill several careers. So I think I think John's probably John's greatest point is his originality. I think John's greatest strength probably is, has been his ability to get other people enthusiastic. Uh, John has never been a, a, not a serious manager anyway. He may have been a manager at some low level, I don't know. But if you look around the company, there always seem to be half a dozen people working on ideas of John. So I guess his strength is, is to get other people involved. I, like I think I first met John on a task force in 1960, which was shortly after I'd come to IBM. And there was a task force run by Ed Adams, which was to look into the that, that year's cryogenic project, this is not the Josephson project, this was an earlier cryogenic project, which uh, was based on a device that had been invented, I think, by somebody at MIT called the Cryotron, which uh, was thought could be used as a logical device for computers. And there was a project in research to design a system based on this, and it was getting into trouble, there were certain discrepancies, and there was a suspicion that the emperor's clothes were not, not quite as, they, as new as they should be. And uh, there was, uh, Ed Adams, I think it was, organized a task force which was to look into this. And John was on this task force, as I was. And I remember John from those days as uh, being, in, being in his uh, scruffy and uh, tobacco-stained phase, which is not the same John that we know nowadays. But uh, always having something, uh, always having a, a penetrating question to ask and, or, a, or a brilliant observation to make on the, on the, during the task force meetings. For many years, John told me in idle conversation about a watch that he owned, which had been left to him by a friend of his father's. The friend himself must have been rather eccentric, because this was a gentleman who, who was really in love with fine watches. And he was so enthusiastic about really nice watches, that, and he was in a position to, to uh, do something about it. And so he had arranged with some Swiss factory, I think it was Patek Philippe, to have a little workshop in the end of his living room where there were always one or two watchmakers building one, you know, custom made, expensive, fancy watches. And this friend of John's father had a watch made for himself under these conditions. And this watch had every gadget known to the, it was a mechanical watch, none of your modern quartz electronic stuff. Not a digital watch, it was an, an old-fashioned mechanical watch, but it had every gadget known to, uh, to horology. And uh, John had told me about this watch from time to time, and he was all, and I was really interested, and I kept saying, John, you really must show me, I'd like to see this, sounds like a marvelous watch. And John would say, oh yes, I'll bring it in and I'll show it to you. And so it went on like this for years. John had never actually got the watch around when the subject came up. But one day, John and I were having lunch together, and the subject of the watch came up, and I said, John, you know, you've been telling me about this watch for years, and for years I've been bugging you to show it to me, and I've never seen it. And he said, oh, well, that's all right. It's up in my office now, and we'll go up after lunch, and I'll show it to you. So after lunch, we went up to John's office, and he started looking in drawers and under papers on the desk and so on, and he couldn't find it, and he started looking in his filing cabinet, and it wasn't there. And he said, well, I, I, I know I had it, but I can't remember where I put it. Maybe I gave it to my secretary to look after. So we went into the secretary's office next door, and he was a little hesitant to go rummaging too much, but he looked in a few obvious places, and it wasn't there. So we went back to John's office until this, and talked about something else until the secretary arrived. And then John went back and asked, asked her if uh, he had given her his watch to look after. And she said, oh, yes, I filed it under W. And she went to the, to the filing cabinet and got it out. And here is this watch. It's maybe, it's a large pocket watch, and it's uh, all gold, and it weighs perhaps a quarter of a pound. It's what's called a half hunter. It has a separate metal lid on the front with a little piece of glass in it through which you can just see the hands, and you open that if you want to see the real dial. And then when you get to the real dial, as I said, it's got every gadget that you can imagine. It's a very complicated stopwatch. It knows about, it's got a calendar, a mechanical calendar that knows about leap years. And it's what's called a, it's what's called a repeating watch. That means if, you, if you're in the dark and you can't see the face, you can still f tell the time by pressing a button. And then it rings little bells, uh, one, one particular sequence for the hour, another for the quarters, and another for the minutes. So you can tell to the nearest minute what the time is without being able to see it. And on the front, it says Patek Philippe, 57 jewels. Now, 
normally speaking, any watch that's got more than 17, that claims to have more than 17 jewels is just boasting because there aren't more than 17 useful places to put a jewel in an ordinary watch. But I think this one really justified it. Anyway, John wound it up and passed it to me and I pushed all the buttons and played with it. And I was very impressed. And then after a few minutes, it stopped. And I said, oh dear, it seems to have stopped. And John said, oh yes, it needs cleaning. And I said, so I said to John, well, this is, this is such a marvelous watch. You really should get it in, in, in good running order. You, you should get it cleaned. And he said, well, I tried once, but it didn't work out. And I said, well, you mean it didn't work out? And he said, well, I really thought I should get it cleaned. And so one day I looked in the yellow pages to see who the importers for Patek Philippe were. And it was Tiffany's. So one day, well, at some point when I was in Manhattan and I could go there and had got the watch with me. I went to Tiffany's and I found the watch repair counter and I said, uh, good morning, and the man behind the counter said, good morning, sir. Do you repair Patek Philippe watches? Oh, yes, sir. Well, I have one here that I think needs cleaning. And the, John passed the watch over, apparently, and the man's face became very concerned. He said, oh, excuse me, sir, I'll be back in a moment. And he went behind the counter, obviously, to consult with the resident watchmakers. And a few moments later, he came back and said, uh, no, I'm sorry, sir, I'm afraid we can't help you. And John said, but I thought you were the, the importers for Patek Philippe. And the man said, oh, yes, sir, but we don't handle the expensive ones. And this is from Tiffany's. So, subsequently, John gave it to a retired technician at the lab who had spent all his life uh, as a... Uh, he'd spent all his life being a, a watchmaker in his spare time a man named Earl Harden, and uh, John, John gave it to him, and he cleaned it and put it in a perfect running order. And uh, I think John has now given the watch to his nephew, but it's, it was uh, something that I'd heard about for years. But when it was finally found, it was in his secretary's filing cabinet under W. That is a great story. <laughs> I mean, there are all kinds of other stories. else that knows that story, either. That's wonderful. <coughs> That's there are all kinds of other stories about John Cock, but I don't, you know, they were all, they're all second hand, you know, about buying a, his car brakes when he's skiing and he just writes a check and that's, and, uh, and the shirts, the shirt boxes in the office and all that, you know, the shirt boxes in the office. No? Well, there was a time when, if it, every time you want, tried to get into John Cock's office, you were in danger of knocking over a pile of sh shirt boxes. They'd start that high and then they were that high and that high and that high. And it turned out the reason there were so many shirt boxes in John's office was that he liked to wear a clean shirt every day, but he never could around, get around to taking them to the laundry. So he'd just buy a new shirt when he felt he needed one, put the old shirt, usually I think he changed at the lab, put the old shirt in the, in the shirt box and put it on the top of the pile. It was, some of us keep papers on our desk on the same principle that you can, tell, you can find things by, by an archaeological method. You know when it, approximately when you last saw it, so you know how far down the pile it must be. Well, I think John's shirts were organized on the same arrangement. I think finally when they got right up to the ceiling, somebody convinced him that he could, uh, he could actually get these shirts washed in the laundry. <laughs> and, uh, well, there's the one about the car, but that I've only heard about third hand. Okay. Well, I've only heard this story at the third, second or third hand, but I understand there was a time when John was off skiing and he was about to drive home on a Sunday and his car broke down. And so he's got to get home by Monday morning. So he found a Buick dealer who would open up his shop, open up his uh, dealership. And there was a, a suitable Buick on the floor. And John said, I'll take that one. And the dealer told him how much the price was. And John wrote out, said, John wrote out a check. And the dealer said, well, I'm sorry, sir, but I, I can't let you take possession of the car with a, just on the basis of a check. After all, I really don't know who you are. I've never seen you before. You don't live around here. You live in another state. I'd have to have some, at least some reference from a bank or something before I can, before I can accept a check. Is there somebody or some institution that, you could, that I could call on a Sunday who could uh, vouch for you? And John said, well, I'm, I don't know, but there's a... This vice president of IBM, who probably at home now, that you could call. So I don't, I don't really know which vice president it was, but apparently, the dealer called a vice a vice president of the company on a Sunday morning and was able to get through. And he said, I, "My name is Joe Bloggs. I'm the president of Bloggs Buick dealership in somewhere in Vermont." And I said, "I have a gentleman in my." Uh, in my showroom who has written me a check for many thousands of dollars, how many thousands of dollars for a new car and he's given your name as a reference and uh, I wondered if you know anything about him and the, whoever the vice president was said, uh, is his name John Cock? 
And the dealer said, yes, that's right, it's Mr. John Cock. He's good for anything he can write. Any check he can write, I'll, I'll stand behind. That's hard to say. I mean, everybody I know, like, I mean, everybody, everybody that I know who knows John Cock absolutely, as you say, loves him. Yeah, it's uh, can he's you say, a, Can you put that but I don't know. yourself? I'm sorry? I, you don't want to say as I say because no. I'm not part of the video. Yeah. So could you put that yeah. again independent to yourself? I don't know what makes John so well liked, but I do know that everybody that I know who knows him is not merely friendly with him, but if they know him at all well, I think they really love him. There's something about his character that makes, that turns people on, but it's hard to me, for me to put my finger on exactly what it is. But a, lo a lot of brilliant people are somewhat childish, but I don't think that's the case here. I don't think, I mean, I'm, John is childish like uh, many other people in the sense of loving to play with ideas. It's, it's re he's not happy unless he's playing with some new idea, so there's a childishness in that sense, but I don't think that's the reason that people are so fond of him. It's hard for me to put my finger on the key to it.